Good morning, everybody. It's really, really a pleasure to welcome uh, Christina Garrigos this morning. And it's a pleasure to see you all gathered here to listen to her. So thank you very much for being here this morning. I'm very grateful that we can give her a warm welcome. Uh, so Christina Garrigos is Professor of American Literature at UNED, that is the National University of Distance Education in Spain. She earned her PhD in English Literature at the University of Sevilla and has a master's degree in comparative literature from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research interests include contemporary American literature, film, music, punk, memory, and gender studies. She has taught at several universities, both in Spain and in the United States, has published on authors such as Katie Hacker, Gloria Ansaldoa, um, uh, Gianina Bracci, Elena Maria Vidamontes, Don Delilo, and Ruth Osecki, um, among others. Her publications include the book John Barth, Un Autor en Busca de Cuatro Personajes, the Spanish edition of uh, uh, Charlotte Lennox's The Female Quixote, and most recently, a book. Alzheimer's Disease in Contemporary American Fiction, Memory Loss, Lost, published in 2021. As part of her interest in music, she is co-author of the book of interviews, God Save the Queens, Pioneras del Punk, with, I'm not sure I pronounced it correctly, <laughs> uh, with Paula Guerra and Nuria Triana and the editor of Punk Connections, a transcultural perspective in 2017 with Nuria Triana. Her latest book is Women in Rock Memoirs, Music, History and Life Writing, public, published in 2023, that is this year. And she is, last but not least, she is the president of the Spanish Association of American Studies. So we are um, very honored to welcome you here today, especially because uh, we've had a lot of administrative problems to organize this visit. And um, I want to apologize um, really publicly for all the trouble that um, Christina went through, but I'm not going to talk about that. Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, very happy to be here. Merci beaucoup. Uh, and uh, thank you, Pascal, for the invitation. I'm thrilled uh, to be here with you and uh, your students. No need to apologize, really. Uh, we all know how administration can be very difficult. Uh, in Spain, it's terrible. What can I say? So it's really a pleasure uh, to be here with you today uh, in this uh, seminar. And um, so happy to, to see so many students. Um, my university is a distance education university, so I don't really see my students uh, so that often. So it's great to see these, these faces. OK, um, well, uh, today I'm going to talk about um, unhousing in literary representations of Alzheimer's disease. I know this is a topic. Maybe you would be happier if I spoke about women in rock or punk. Uh, but uh, this is another of my areas of interest. And uh, I think it's an important area of interest, actually. But before I begin to speak, I would like to contextualize a little bit of my research and explain what I do. And uh, this is part uh, of a project uh, from the University of Barcelona uh, titled Unhousing Dwellings, Materiality, and the Self in American Literature. And um, this, in, this, in this project, I mean, uh, we analyze how and I'm going to read from the website, uh, how American literature proposes that in those cases where the ideal of a socially sanctioned domestic space proves traumatic, hurtful, or antagonistic to a satisfactory constitution of free subjectivities, it is better to opt for a process of what Paula G. referred to as unhousing, 
that is, a movement to the margins of the relatively stable structures of society and the deconstructing of a unitary ground subjectivity. So basically, this is what we do. We are several uh, researchers. And as part of this project, um, uh, I work on Alzheimer's, um, basically because I wrote a book uh, that you have um, here. Uh, it was published in Routlet uh, 2023, uh, 21 two years ago. And uh, as Pascal has explained this, this in this book, I studied uh, memory, memory loss, uh, in representation, literary representations of Alzheimer's uh, in American fiction. I, uh, I actually studied uh, eight authors uh, who wrote a uh, text where they had uh, an interest in, in Alzheimer's and how they represented this, this, memory, this memory loss. Uh, in this book, I did not uh, pay um, attention, well, I, I referred to, but I didn't study the importance of houses uh, in Alzheimer's. And this is what I'm actually doing now. And, uh, and what I'm going to discuss with you today uh, is, is part of a work in progress. Uh, so I'm still struggling with some concepts and some theories and some notions. And I would love to hear uh, your response and your feedback and your questions so that I can improve uh, my, uh, my research. OK? So bear with me. OK. Um, there is one famous uh, book and a famous movie, and of course I have to cite it, is Lisa Genova's Still Alice. You probably, some of you have seen the, the movie, okay? And at one point in the, in the novel, um, which is um, like the basis of the film adaptation, um, Alice um, is, is lost while trying to find uh, the bathroom in her own house. And I quote from the novel, how can I be lost in my own home? She thought about bolting upstairs to the full bath, but she was strangely stuck and dumbfounded into the twilight zone, like bathroomless dimension of the first floor. She was unable to hold it any longer. She had an ethereal sense of observing herself. This poor, unfamiliar woman crying in the hallway it didn't sound like uh, some, the somewhat guarded cry of an adult woman. It was the scared, defeated, and unrestrained crying of a small child. Her tears weren't all she was able to contain any longer. John burst through the front door just in time to witness the urine streaming down her right leg, soaking her sweatpants, sock, and sneaker. I'm lost. Okay, uh, this is a powerful image uh, and, uh, of, of a person with, with Alzheimer. Uh, Alice has early onset Alzheimer's. Um, and uh, well, if most detective narrative uh, try to answer the question, who did it, right? Uh, in what we could call Alzheimer's narrative, the, the, that is books that have Alzheimer's as a central topic, the question often starts with where. Where am I? Where is my house? For instance, in a novel by the Spanish uh, writer Paloma Diaz Mas, Lo que olvidamos, What We Forget, uh, the narrator explains that her mother does not recognize the place where she has lived all her life. She wants to get out and look for su casa, her house. She looks at the furniture that she does not identify and is surprised to find her clothes in the closet. The narrator explains how her mother desencuentra and finds her things. And so the objects appear before her eyes as if seen for the first time or connected with other objects in her memory, such as what used to be her favorite cup that in her mind now belongs to her mother. Her house becomes an unknown place, a labyrinth where she gets lost in a confusing habitat that is no longer hers. She is unhoused in her own house. Unhousing is common in all the literary representations of Alzheimer's. In the novels where the protagonist is a person with Alzheimer's disease, 
and housing plays a central role since the action usually takes place either in the house where the person lives or in a residential facility where they are almost inevitably taken. Uh, and uh, for instance, in, and, uh, this is like a parenthesis, in the US, uh, the special facilities for people with dementia are known as special care units or dementia units. Uh, and in this paper, I'm going to avoid using what I see as loaded term, uh, nursing home, and I will employ the more general term, uh, residential unit, okay? I will explain this later. Okay, uh, the loss of special memory brought by the neurological deterioration in Alzheimer's processes causes disorientation in a space that used to be familiar, such as one's own house. Special memory is the ability to remember places and things, and as such, special disorientation is one of the first signs that may lead to an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. According to neuroscientists, spatial memory loss is caused by an atrophy in the hippocampal formation. For Silva and Martinez, AD, Alzheimer's disease, is a multifactorial neurodegenerative disorder affecting mainly the hippocampus and torrhenal cortex circuit. Consequently, the initial stages of the disease have disorientation and wandering behavior as two of its hallmark. Alzheimer's disease patients lose the ability to navigate an environment, even one as familiar as one's house, losing the cognitive map, that is, the internal representation of a space, of a space based on prior knowledge as well as the ability to process the information related to it and to interpret multisensorial inputs. As Colombo explains, spatial navigation is the ability to find and maintain a route from one place to another. On the other hand, spatial memory is the ability to encode, store, and retrieve spatial information through the construction and storage of spatial representation. The neurological deterioration of the hippocampus caused by the disease is the reason why persons with Alzheimer's lose their spatial memory. This disorder involves being unable to find spatial frames of reference, both the egocentric frame and the allocentric frame which involves the spatial information about the position of the objects relative to each other. This, as you see here, the representation of the allocentric and the egocentric, uh, the egocentric, this results in problems in spatial navigation and in the ability to remember and recognize location and objects. According to Deborah Reed Danahy, Persons with Alzheimer's find themselves moving and living in a non-place or non-lieu that, according to Marc Auger, is the result of what he calls the supermodernity. Overabundance of events uh, spatial, wait, not yet. Um, okay, overabundance of events, spatial overabundance, and the individualization of references. The first one has to do with time. The theme of imminent history, of history snapping at our heels, almost imminent in each of our day-to-day -day existences, seems like a premise on the theme of the meaning of non-meaning or history. For it is our need to understand the whole of the present that makes it difficult to, for us to give meaning to the recent past, the appearance among individuals in contemporary societies of a positive demand for meaning. The second um, has to do with transformation uh, in space. There is an overabundance of spaces, a proliferation of images and imaginary references. And the third figure of excess in this supermodernity is for uh, Auger, the ego. In Western societies, at least, the individual was to be a world in himself, 
he intends to interpret the information to himself, by himself, and for himself. And I'm, I'm sorry that I'm quoting Marc Auger in English. I'm sure that you probably read him better in, in French, but okay. Um, okay, um, so for read Tanahi, um, because it is defined against what Auger calls the anthropological place, that is largely imagined uh, in, of connection, memory, and identity, the non-place usefully describes the residential dementia unit. Reed also considers residential units as lieu from the perspective of Bourdieu, where the social class defines the life status of a person. For Bourdieu, life connotes both spatial and social location and is connected to the capital. So concentration of social and economic capital in certain locations can be contrasted to deficits of such forms of capital in other locations of lieu. That is, simply by occupying a space in a particular type of lieu can affect a person's um, social position. Now, in our modern Western society, the house is a place of meaning. We tend to identify ourselves with space material possessions, and objects that we own. Thus, the house where we live is a standing proof of what we have achieved in life, both professionally and personally. If we have uh, managed to own a property, uh, to um, whatever, to have a family, a community, uh, so it defines who we are and what we have achieved in life, or if we have not. It demarcates to what social class we belong. The space where we live in and the objects that are placed in it become an indication of who we are, not only for the people outside of the household, but for the person living in it. It conforms to one's identity, or this is what is commonly believed. However, in the case of Alzheimer's disease, when the egocentric space is devoid of its symbolic meaning, it becomes a non-place. The house goes from being a place, a site of culture located in time and space, to a non-place that the person does not relate to. The moment our spatial memory does not recognize that space, we are deprived of our past. We are living in the present and the now, a situation where we are free from the constraints of the past, unchained, but also vulnerable, due to the emphasis in contemporary Western society on the importance of memory. That is, we are unhoused. This concept of unhouse or unhousing is very different from the concept of unhomely that Homi Baba, which I'm sure uh, whom you, you probably know, um, he, uh, so the concept of unhomely that Homi Baba develops, which he takes from Freud's Amheilich um, and associates with the post-colonial and instability. Whereas home <coughs> refers to a subjective concept the house is an objective space or place. Of course, phenomenological approaches such as Gaston Bachelard see the house as a world of meaning, a place of identity and memory that is associated with the unconscious. Following Bachelard in his study on people with dementia, Beam Deckers explained that very often, the emphasis when discussing dementia is on the cognitive capabilities of the consciousness dimension, of being human. Um, that is the implication of a lack of or a loss of a personhood, right? Um, thus, confronted um, thus, the implication of a lack of personhood, autonomy, and decision-making capacity. Thus, confronted with the loss of cognitive functions and the loss of the consciousness dimension, 
people with dementia face the loss of a shared world of meaning, that is, the loss of a home. Decker explores the idea of the human condition and the notion of home in terms of the five constituents of the life world uh, recognized by phenomenologists. Okay. Temporality, speciality, intersubjectivity, embodiment, and mood. He sees these notions as intertwined, and he applies them to provide four interpretations of the term home or coming home, okay? So the home, or this idea of home, apart from being this temporality, speciality, intersubjectivity, embodiment, and mood, uh, are, okay? One's own house or home-like environment, this is home, right? Uh, one's own body, the psychosocial environment, and or the spiritual dimension, in particular, the origin of human existence. This is all related to the notion of home, right? Um, okay, the first interpretation refers to the physical place where one lives, right? Uh, the house. Uh. The second owns body, uh, the well-being of own, one's own body. The third to the psychosocial well, um, well-being and the fourth to the process of dying. So that, uh, as Herzog explains, behind the question, where am I, okay, which is often asked by disoriented persons with dementia, fundamental questions might be hidden, such as who am I and where is my home? These questions imply an understanding of home as physical and material space, that is the house where one lives, but also the psychological environment of the body, whose progressive loss is an indication of the ine inevitability, inevitability of death. Now, these phenomenological notions of home loss associated with dementia brings us into a dark territory one which is aligned with negative portrayals of Alzheimer's that focus on the disease as a stage between life and death and perpetuate, in my view, stereotypes and stigma with references to Alzheimer's patients as sufferers or victims uh, that are represented as living death figures, hollow bodies, or even zombies. You said a person suffers from Alzheimer's or suffers from dementia. Instead of that, I mean, uh, we propose that we say a person has dementia, a person has Alzheimer's, right? Which is a little bit less negative. Huh? Um, okay. Unlike homeliness and homeliness or homelessness, and housing focuses mainly on the material reality of the living space. The space is often a site of subjective meaning that exists symbolically, but it is first and foremost objectively a material place. Hence, when the subjective meaning is lost due to um, the external reasons, spatial amnesia due to Alzheimer's disease, for instance, what remains is the objective space, the rooms, the walls, the doors, and the objects. That is, in other words, when the ego does not recognize the surroundings, the uh, egocentric frame becomes allocentric. That is, a door is a door, a wall is a wall, a table is a table, even if you don't recognize it, okay? Um, so it has a meaning that is relative to the perspective of some subject other than itself. The person with Alzheimer becomes dependent on other person, other people to navigate the space for them and to make sure that the basic needs are covered. Not recognizing the spatial, uh, the architecture, the spatial design and the objects in one place implies a resignification of the idea of the individual identity associated with possession and dependence. Um, so, in, in other words, I mean, like, what happens? I mean, if the person with Alzheimer does not recognize his house or her house, is that less of a person? I mean, she is not a person anymore or he's not a person anymore? 
Uh, this is the big question, right? Well, um, when the person with Alzheimer's disease does not recognize the habitat and the object that have been with them, things that ha they have accumulated through life, the object and the house remain the same, but it is the egocentric space that is broken. The objective relationship between the person and the object is the same, but the symbolic relationship with the materiality of the house changes. Now, from this perspective, losing the spatial memory of the house implies that when the individual cannot navigate the space, the place becomes a site of estrangement, an uncharted territory. Losing oneself in one's own house and not recognizing the object that have been with a person their whole life are causes of anguish and anxiety, especially at first, but in many cases, the detachment from material things that comes from the destruction of the egocentric space and its replacement by an allocentric one can also lead to a state of peaceful relocation. Hence, unhousing is not related to losing one's identity and one's place in the world, as Deckers and others seem to point out, and um, basically, in my opinion, it is problematic to say that memory loss implies losing one identity. The negativity associated with forgetting only reinforces a binary position where remembery is associated with life and forgetting or oblivion with death. Marc Coget, among others, is very critical of the obsession that we have with memory in our contemporary Western society arguing that a certain amount of forgetting is necessary and recommended to be able to advance. Likewise, arguing that spatial loss and dislocation imply identity loss is quite reductive and dangerous too. And this distinction is particularly relevant in representations of Alzheimer's. As I will try to prove in the following section, and this was like the most th theoretical section, so now I'm going to give you some examples, okay? Um, literary representations of Alzheimer's focus on the replacement of the egocentric spatial position by an allocentric one when unhousing occurs, allowing for the collaboration of the family members and a more interdependent perspective instead than one that fosters independence and materialism as ruling concepts in one's life. However, literary representations of Alzheimer's often offer a critical view of unhousing as the result of displacement by external forces, such as the actions of uh, the members of an individualistic and materialistic society where persons with Alzheimer's live. Okay, the first example that I want to discuss is this novel, uh, Turn of Mind, by Alice Laplante. And this is a novel, uh, it's a crime novel, a detective novel. Um, and in this, in this novel, um, Jennifer White, a successful orthopedic hand surgeon with early onset Alzheimer's, is accused of murdering her best friend and neighbor, Amanda. Now, uh, there are three sp spaces in, uh, in this novel. At first, uh, Jennifer is locked into her house with a caretaker. Uh, later, in two institutions, a nursing home and the state facility for the criminally insane. Now, in these uh, three spaces, her movements are controlled by guardians and she is progressively deprived of her autonomy while losing all spatial references. Now, the author presents unhousing as a metaphor for society's manipulation of people with cognitive impairment. The first part of the novel takes place, as I said, in Jennifer's house, where she lives with Magdalena, who is a caretaker that her children have hired to look after her. Jennifer does not recognize the house or the people in it, and it is Magdalena who provides the meaning for her. So the egocentric space becomes allocentric as she depends on other people. Uh, and I'm going to read a quotation from the novel. 
This morning, Magdalena put a red and white stick in my hand at the bathroom sink. Toothbrush, she said, but the word mean nothing. I came to later at the kitchen table with a half-eaten stick of butter in front of me. Then I had another fade out and fade in. I think I found myself sitting in the same place, but now with a glass full of orange liquid on the table in front of me, a pile of multicolored pills. What is this? I asked Magdalena, pointing. The colors were wrong. The bright liquid and the small, hard, round burst of blue magenta buttercup. Poison. I would not be fooled. Was not fooled. Flush all down the toilet when Magdalena was not looking. So as you see in this example, she does not recognize, she doesn't know what a toothbrush is. She, doesn't, she thinks that this person is trying to poison her by giving her pills of strange colors, uh, and she flushes them down the toilet, right? Uh, so she has this, the egocentric space is broken. She does not recognize the things. And it is Magdalena who provides the meaning, so the space becomes allocentric. A pill is a pill, a toothbrush is a, is a toothbrush, right? But she does not recognize them because of her dementia. Uh, it is Magdalena's role to take care of Jennifer, but Jennifer believes that she is part of a conspiracy together with her children to take control over her body and her house. Her perception, however, is right. Her children and Magdalena want to control the body, her body and her house, uh, but in a positive, let's say, way. I'm not giving any spoilers here. Uh, the novel, in case you want to read it, it's a really good one. Um, okay, now when this control of her body and her house is no longer possible, she is taken to a nursing facility and they sell her house. And as her son says, it's not just the keys, mom, says the boy. It's the agitation, the aggression, the wandering, your inability to use the bathroom, take care of basic sanitary needs, refusing your medication. It's too much for Magdalena. Who is Magdalena? Magdalena, right here, see? You don't even remember the woman who lives with you, who takes care of you, wonderful care. So Magdalena controls Jennifer's well-being and helps her navigate the space of the house. But she, Magdalena, she is also unhoused as she is deprived of her job and her lodgings when Jennifer is taken to a residential facility. So as Reed Danahue points out, it is not just the Alzheimer's patients who are subject to dislocation. The potential family caregivers are often transient and mobile. The second chapter of Turn of Mind shows Jennifer in a residential facility. Although this is a caring establishment, Jennifer perceives it as a punishment for some crime that she has committed. And so, since the reader sees everything at this point, uh, from her perspective, we empathize with her understanding of this place as a prison. She refers to the interns as incarcerated animals and consist, considers her situation as a descent from one circle of hell into the next. Paradoxically, for Jennifer, the horror of the place has to do with cleaning and luxury. She says, an extraordinary clean place this is. They are constantly scrubbing, vacuuming, touching up the paint, dusting, fixing. It is pristine and luxurious. A five-star hotel with guard rays, the reeds for the mentally infirm, plum cushion chairs in the great room, an enormous flat screen television in the TV lounge, fresh flowers everywhere, the scent of money. Now for Jennifer, cleaning the premises and washing is an indication of force control over her and she rejects that as she feels she's been deprived of her privacy and her identity. She's been cleaned out and returned to the status of a blank slate. She wants to be preserved as I am. And she associates cleaning with the descent into madness or the path towards suffering and death. Now, the residential unit where Jennifer is placed is designed for a wealthy clientele. She's a very rich doctor, okay? Now, its luxury is meant to emphasize continu uh, continuity during the transition from living at home to living at the residential unity. However, when a person with Alzheimer's is taken to a care facility, 
the unfamiliarity of the space and non-recognition may result in unhousing, which is why they seek to escape from it. Also, due to the impersonal characteristics of the residential facilities, many people with Alzheimer's disease identify this as a working place instead of a dwelling place. And this is the case in turn of mind because Jennifer is a doctor, so she thinks that she is working there, actually, and she asks to go home. She wants to go home every day. Home, right? Jennifer tries to return to her house, although mentally she mixes the family house of her childhood with that of her married life, w which her children have sold. She refuses to believe her daughter when she tells her about the sale of the house, and she actually tries to go back there one night. Even though Jennifer has her things with her at the residential unit, she does not recognize the space, again, because the egocentric space has been broken. So she packs every day trying to go back to a place that does not exist anymore. Finally, in the last chapter, Jennifer is taken to a prison, uh, a state institution after being condemned for killing Amanda. And I'm not saying if she is guilty or not. You have to read the book. <laughs> but she's taken to a prison. Okay. Uh, and there, um, in this place, there are no niceties. She says, there are no soft edges, there is no salvation. Once a day they are let out of the room, allowed to walk around a cement courtyard. Now at this point in the narrative, Jennifer's Alzheimer is very advanced. We see the progression in the, in the narrative, right? Uh, and uh, the narrative is delivered by a third person external narrator, since by now the readers, we need some external coherence. Now the mind of the protagonist has become a dark space full of hallucinations, fragmented memories mixed with dreams. Thus the hermeneutical path of the readers toward the clearing of uh, Amanda's murder runs parallel to Jennifer's progressive neurological deterioration and unhousing. Okay, now Laplante's portrait of Jennifer's vulnerability and the manipulative behavior of those around her highlight the reader's empathy towards the person with Alzheimer's. So in this novel, in turn of mind, Jennifer's Al Alzheimer's disease leads to her unhousing. First, she's in prison and confined because of her dementia, then because of the accusation that she has committed a crime. So Laplante presents unhousing as a consequence of the manipulative actions of uh, both internal, that is Alzheimer's, and external society. Okay, the second example, very quick, that I want uh, to give you is a novel published in 2014 by Matthew Thomas um, titled, We Are Not Ourselves. And as you can see, I mean, like even the cover here, it has some houses and actually houses are really important uh, in connection with Alzheimer's in this, in this novel. Now, in this novel, the narrative, well, the, the, the person with Alzheimer's is Ed Leary, but the narrative actually is focused on uh, his wife, Aileen, who is the daughter of two Irish immigrants in New York, and she has the American dream. Aileen dreams of having a big house, moving to the suburbs, and taking her son, Connell, the author's alter ego, to a good college. Now, when her husband is diagnosed with Alzheimer's, all these uh, dreams are shattered. There is, in this novel, a reflection of individualism in modern society on the false expectations and failures of the American dream, the lack of resources by the state, there is a, a critique of the, of the, the American uh, health system, how expensive it is for a person uh, to pay for the care when a person has uh, Alzheimer's. And, and the failure of the system is represented by young housing in this novel. Now, as opposed to Aileen, Ed is not interested in buying a house, which is an obsession for his wife. The idea of owning a house is presented as a metaphor for the American dream, but the house becomes a powerful symbol related to the disease. As the author has declared, I find it fascinating the way that owning a home changes one's life, changes one's orientation towards the world. Now, on the one hand, Ed is unhoused when Aileen decides to move them out of the apartment where they live, 
because she thinks that the neighborhood is becoming dangerous due to the increasing number of migrants. Now, moving a doubt when he is in an uh, early stage of Alzheimer implies double displacement. Now, he has disorientation issues and uh, he's placed in a new environment, so uh, he does not recognize the new house. Right. A conceptual metaphor in the novel related to dementia is the house they buy, because it has many structural issues that Aileen does not want to acknowledge. She wants to buy a big, impressive house, but she cannot afford the house of her dreams. So she decides that she is going to buy a house that has all the characteristics of grandeur, but it is priced lower because it has damage and needs renovation. Now, the problems that the house has represent uh, Alzheimer's, the problems that Alzheimer's bring to their lives, important structural issues that require money and care. Now, Aileen's obsession with having a big house impedes her from dealing with the reality of her husband's disease. But she, soon she is not able to deny that any longer. She watched him and waited for the mishap, the big slip up. He continued to make incremental programs and continued to refuse outside help. But every day, as he beat himself harder and harder to finish the work, as she watched patiently, intently, she could feel the ground shifting in her favor, Ed's resilience weakening. Okay, uh, Ed thinks that he can do the repairs that the house need by himself, but it is obvious that he cannot. Huh? Uh, he hadn't moved in half an hour. He was in the same place in the middle of the room, a perfect vantage point from which to survey the mess he had insisted on making. Uh, so finally, Aileen assumes that what she has been refusing to believe, that it is not only the house, but her husband that needs help, and that his real self wasn't hiding in there, waiting to be sprung for a day of freedom. This was his real self uh, now. Now, the new house is a hostile space for Ed, a place that he does not recognize. And as the disease advances, Aileen must hire help to do construction work in the house and somebody to take care of Ed until he's taken to a facility unit. Ed is thus unhoused again when he's taken to a residential facility, a place that is presented as a site of loneliness and depression at first which causes the family to experience both a sense of guilt and relief at the same time. This is evident when Connell, his son, decides to take his father out of the nursing uh, facility and take him home for Christmas, and it is a disaster. Uh, Ed does not recognize the place, he does not recognize uh, anybody, right? Uh, <clears throat> so, but his son believed that it would do him good. He said, that's what he wanted to go outside. If only he had known, he would be brought back to life. Of course, it's, it's, uh, this, is, this is a lie, because he is not brought back to life when he goes to the house. As, as I said, uh, the Christmas uh, party is a disaster, right? Um, the reality is that Ed does not recognize the place any longer. The egocentric space uh, frame uh, has been broken. So, uh, so he's returned to the residential facility which has become his new house and is presented as a non-place where strangers actually meet and interact. Now, all the houses in the novel, so the first apartment where Ed and Eileen live, the big new house, the residential facility where they take Ed, signal Ed's progressive unhousing. He moves from an egocentric place to an allocentric one. Progressively, he ends up living in a known place where he's not able to recognize any spatial reference. This is connected to a critique of the United States as an individualistic and materialistic society and the difficulties that a family faces when having someone with Alzheimer's, both economic and all kinds of difficulties, right? By reflecting on these issues, Thomas seems to open the door for a reconsideration of the interactions between family members and the community, advocating for empathy and as an instrument to help unhouse. Okay, and just to conclude, um, 
I'm going to wrap up, okay, and saying uh, again that unhousing is very common in persons with Alzheimer's disease. The fact that persons with Alzheimer's do not recognize familiar spaces of objects place them in a situation of displacement the, the moment they, the disease sets in, as they become strangers in a place that they cannot navigate by themselves. From this perspective, they live in a non-place, a transient lieu, where the house does not have a meaning. From an egocentric perspective, but from an allocentric one. The person does not see the objects for what they are, but from what they are told they are. Remember the toothbrush, right, uh, in turn of mind. They become dependent on other people. This situation, which is very common in real life, I'm sure that uh, some of you probably have experience with some family uh, that has uh, Alzheimer's, this situation becomes central in literary representations of Alzheimer's, as the house has traditionally been the site for metaphors and symbols in literature, I mean like in any kind of literature, right? However, unhousing goes beyond the subjective understanding of the house as a place of comfort or suffering. It implies exploring how the actual materiality of the building is rendered strange for the person with Alzheimer's disease. Thus, it is not the connotations that the house may have only in our conscious, but the materiality of the house that is an obstacle for persons with Alzheimer's who often see the space adapted as if they were children, uh, and they or they must be taken out of the house, hence doubly unhoused. So my talk today has briefly explored unhousing in two novels on Alzheimer's disease, uh, Turn of Mind and by Alice Laplante and We Are Not Ourselves. The two works are very different. They present different representations of unhousing, but both of them have in common <clears throat> a person with Alzheimer's who had lost cognitive capabilities and spatial knowledge. In the first case, the house and the residential facility become preliminaries for the actual prison where the protagonist will be taken. Uh, and in the second case, the obsession with having a big house and fulfilling the American dream does not let Aileen see that her husband is doubly unhoused, first when he's taken out of the house and then when he's taken to a residential facility. So unhousing is regarded as a state that is caused by an alteration in the hippocampus that affects the egocentric space but also by an individual and materialistic society that focuses on independence. These novels prove that an interdependent approach and a focus on empathy could replace the egocentric space, materialistic, individualistic, with an allocentric one. Hence, Non, the non-place is not to be regarded with negative connotation, but rather as a place of transience, a place where time does not apply and where what is important is the present in a space without boundaries. According to Reed Danahy, ethnographers found that by treating the Alzheimer's patient with respect, less of a feeling of dislocation was experienced by the patient. So understanding the concept of unhousing in people with Alzheimer's disease, that is regarding the house where they live and the residential unit where they are taken, not as homes but as non-places where strangers share spaces and interact, may help with the needs of people with Alzheimer's disease to make them feel comfortable not paying so much attention to the dislocation from an egocentric perspective, but to their allocentric relationship. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. That was uh, very interesting indeed. Uh, um, I will... Um, if you don't mind, guys, I will ask the first question. <laughs> I will enjoy the privilege. Um, I wonder whether unhousing is, is not 
inevitable to a certain extent for um, people with dementia. So that uh, whatever may, you may try to do in the end, um, it, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So that my first question. The first question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think uh, that um, housing is inevitable. Uh, what I try to um, understand myself, and uh, I appreciate uh, your question here, is um, is how to turn unhousing as something less negative uh, than um, than it is. I mean, like because it is obvious that this this location exists. Uh, it is obvious that a person with Alzheimer's is not going to recognize a place. Is not going to recognize the object. It's going to be uh, lost. But for instance, in the novel that I mentioned at the beginning, the novel by the Spanish author uh, Paloma Diaz Mas, um, she like the the person with Alzheimer is kind of happy to find her clothes in the closet. Uh, and uh, it is her daughter, actually, that helps her find the bathroom. And uh, and she says she's very excited because she sees like a cup. And she says, oh, well, how beautiful this cup is, you know. And uh, it is something like discovering things as if they were uh, for the first time, you know. Uh, so in that sense is how I believe that um, what I try to, to do is not to think of unhousing as something depressing and something uh, negative, um, but think of of it as a possibility for renewal in the sense of um, of thinking of the materiality of the place as a non-place, as a place that is shared by by strangers and uh, where they interact, and not that is not related to possession and to identity. You know, so a cup is a cup, a toothbrush is a toothbrush, and of course it's sad in a sense that a person obviously with Alzheimer's cannot, does not know what a toothbrush is for. Uh, but of course, I mean, it's like um, re looking at it from a different perspective. Uh, I don't want to be over naive in the sense of saying, OK, no, we can turn Alzheimer's into something wonderful. No, it is very cruel. It is important in the sense that uh, nowadays, I mean, uh, there, there are many people who have Alzheimer's, right? But instead of presenting this portrayal of unhousing as a negative uh, place, as saying they don't recognize their house, they are completely lost. Well, yes, but I mean, like maybe the house is can be looked at from another perspective. That's what basically I'm trying to um, okay. present. I'm not sure. This um, it makes more sense to me. Um, uh, presented this way, it mm. took me a while to mm. um, to understand exactly what you meant. Mm. I mean, yeah, I mean, because I was wondering, uh, so, but d d d there's no escaping yeah, this no, no, no. Uh, this uh, particular stage in the disease. Yeah, uh, when we use the concept of unhousing in this project that we have, uh, it's very like we have uh, we 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 deal with it uh, with like from different perspective and uh, one obvious one for instance is like the idea of not owning a house. For instance, I don't know if you have seen this movie Nomadland. Uh, some of you have well it's about this woman who lo loses her house because i mean like they close like the factory where mm, they work and then the village disappears and then she uh, doesn't have any, a house anymore and she takes she lives in a van and she sort of like uh, moves around meets people live a van uh, so again this is sort of like a, a concept the concept of unhousing is very clear here it's sad in a sense, to lose your house. But at the end, there is one point in the movie, and I'm sorry for the spoiler if you haven't seen it, but where she has to decide if she wants to live in a house or if she's rather happy moving around in her van and meeting other people and, you know, this nomad land, right? And actually, there is a reconsideration of maybe a house is, is also a constraint, you know, uh, for people, you know, this idea of owning a house, living in the same place, you know, this idea of who you are because of the things you you have, you know. Uh, and uh, and this is something that when you apply to Alzheimer's, or it, not only Alzheimer's, but I mean elderly people, elderly people 
when uh, they they tend to sort of like collect things, right? And it's difficult for them to lose their things, you know. But uh, it but in the end, when we die, I mean, like we're not taking anything with us, right? I mean, so I mean, the importance of things is relative too, right? Um, so this is basically what my thoughts are. So. And d does this project involve? This, uh, the, 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 I mean, not just the disease, but also, okay. Yeah, I'm like in this project, sort of like I'm the one defining and housing in relation to Alzheimer's. But it's a huge, I mean, it's, we are like uh, 16 people, and it's like some people deal with like living in, on the sea, on a boat, for instance. I mean, like uh, the concept of the, mm, traveling around on a boat uh, so in literature, I mean, like losing your house, I mean, uh, or some, even in the 19th century, I mean, this feminist woman who uh, designed uh, a house uh, without a kitchen, for, you know, because they, they, she didn't want women to be in the kitchen all the time, right? I mean, like this very modern idea. Right? So, so, kind of, yeah. Uh, questions? Are there questions? Yes, Melini. So, please, my friend here has a question. Uh, did you work on any depiction of literal announcing, like homelessness and living in the streets, for poor people with dementia? Uh, not me, um, but no, I haven't done it, but it's a, it's a very interesting uh, topic and definitely, I mean, like in our project, we have uh, people who are working on homeless people, uh, but we haven't uh, done this uh, crossing, I mean, like homeless people with dementia, for instance, I mean, that's something that I may do uh, in the future, but uh, I haven't done it yet, but thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I have a question maybe coming back to what you were saying about a change in uh, perspective and objects because um, especially when you were talking about um, in the uh, Slepon's novel mm -hmm. uh, about the toothbrush, um, it really reminded me of um, you know, Victor Schottis' formalist essay, Artist Technique, mm -hmm. and how um, habitualization devours and how uh, by slowing down the process of perception, we can invite people to see objects again as for the first time. So I was wondering, if maybe it's more on the reader reception side, mm -hmm. uh, if you um, ever had that in mind at all, if you use that as a lens at all? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh that's interesting. I mean, like, no, I haven't, uh, I haven't thought of it. I mean, like, in this, in this case, definitely. I mean, like, the the reader plays an interesting um, function in the in this um, in this explanation of the object. Uh, for instance, like the depiction of the of the object, right? Because I mean, like, the protagonist does not know what the toothbrush is, and obviously it is the reader that provides also, I mean, like, that gets this information. So it's very interesting, yes? No? Yeah, 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 I hadn't thought of it, but yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Um, did you notice um, any differences between uh, the representation of uh, uh, female characters that have Alzheimer's and, and comparing it to like men characters that have uh that have Alzheimer's, yes. Uh, well, actually, yes, there is uh, a difference. Uh, in the novels that I analyzed in, in my book, most of the characters that have Alzheimer's are women. Uh, actually, um, only two I think of the novels that I analyzed. I mean, like, of course, there are many, many novels, and um, and what I notice is how uh, the, the the importance of the family, especially the wife, uh, was bigger. I mean, like, the the, the spouse was bigger in uh, when the the person was um, a man than a, a woman. In other words, uh, let's say that. Um, when the person is a man, it seems like there is like more focus on the, his wife and married life and the importance of marriage and uh, and so on. Um, and when the protagonist is a woman, it's different. Uh, in general, I think that there is more focus on uh, children, the relationship with children. 
um, and uh, um, even the profession. Um, but l if you think, for instance, of Still Alice, uh, of the novel by Lisa Genova, um, what is important, I mean, like, the husband is there and so on, but I mean, like, it's, uh, she actually has more of an interaction with the children uh, than with her husband. Um, there is this novel by an African-American author, Marita Golden, uh, and uh, The White Circumference of Love. And in this novel, um, the, the person with Alzheimer's is a man. And the novel is narrated like from the point of view of the perspective of the wife, as in Matthew Thomas's uh, We Are Not uh, Ourselves. It's like basically how she feels about her husband not recognizing her. Uh, well, in, in Golden's case, when they take him to a nursing um, facility, he, he thinks that his wife is another person woman there, right? So she is replaced by another person, right? And for her, it's like kind of hard at the beginning, but then at the end, she has a boyfriend, and in the end, it's kind of this modern family, right? Uh, that where they are, they care about each other, but they are, you know. So uh, in general, to my, to your question, my answer would be, I would think that in the cases where the man uh, is uh, the patient with Alzheimer's, uh, in, in the, in books, uh, there is, mm, the focus is on the, the wife. And I don't see that in those cases where the focus is on, on the is is a woman. Yes, Nina. If I can go again, um, I really liked what, um, you, when you talked about the egocentric versus allocentric space. As it was, my pre question is, um, do you have the reference for that so I can selfishly write it down? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I can. Um, let me see. Well, this is a concept, I mean, like, because I'm working with all kind of these medical humanity things and so on. And so This is a concept that you can find uh, easily. Um, th there are lots of, let me see. I can give them to you uh, if you want, but basically it's a concept that it's used uh, very often uh, in medical humanities, well, and in medicine. Mm. me <laughs> wait is this it then? oh sorry yeah um for instance neil burgess has an article that is spatial memory how egocentric and allocentric combine um Basically, he has done a lot of, of um, that it's Neil Burgess, B-U-R-G-E-S-S. -S. Okay. So my real question, um, within um, literature, I think we can uh, study narratives, I was wondering, can we, if we're in a situation where we have a focal character, mm -hmm. can we really have an allocentric space? Or is there always some relation or representation of perception that will make it lean towards you? Well, that's, very, that's a very interesting question because the thing is that obviously if you have a first person narrator and the narration is focalized in him, it's, you have a very egocentric narrator. I mean, like it's a very egocentric perspective. Now, obviously, what is interesting in this case, for instance, in Alice Laplante's Turn of Mind, is that we have a first person narrator focalized in the first person who has dementia. So the egocentric disappears because she does not recognize that in relation to herself. The egocentric means that you recognize space in, from your perspective. That door is in front of me. Pascal is to my right. Okay? This is egocentric because it, I am the person speaking, yes? Uh, but of course, if I say, um, well, Pascal is sitting on a chair on the table and, uh, and I give, you know, uh, an information that does not depend on me, right? That's allocentric. But when you have a first person narrator and the action is focalized on the first person narrator and I say, I feel, I see, I think, this is egocentric. The moment you see, I see. That's it. So it's, 
it's because the imagination sees the space as if they were there that it's <laughs> No, allocentric means that you see the space as it is, okay. not from many perspectives. I mean, like, a window is a window, yes? This window is here. This window can be seen from your perspective or from somebody else's who is outside. You can describe this window from here or from outside, or you can describe the window from an allocentric perspective, meaning that it depends on like the things. It depends on the wall, on the, t on the, you can say it's next to a door, whatever. I mean, like give some other information, but it's not depending on a person. Does it make sense? Other questions? Yes, Juliet. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned that in the two novels that you have studied, um, there is um, an idea of a critical view of the idea that memory loss triggers um, a loss of identity. Mm -hmm. However, I feel like in those two books, at least, um, Alzheimer's disease is always used as a metaphor for um, a sense of loss of cultural identity in a community. Mm -hmm. So how do you reconcile those two ideas? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh yeah, in general, I mean, like, uh, there is this notion, and I think that is not only in literature, but I think that in society, that memory loss implies a loss of identity. Um, in these novels, I mean, like, in the novels that I have discussed, um, I would say that uh, the authors are very critical uh, with uh, the, this idea. That is, the idea that memory loss implies a loss of identity. Um, for instance, it's very interesting that uh, in Matthew Thomas's uh, "We Are Not Ourselves," the the voice of the of the protagonist is absent, basically until the end when he leaves a letter explaining things to his son and so on and so forth. Right? Um, but the emphasis is on everything that surrounds this memory loss. This this. Um, and, uh, and it is um, very critical with the way that in our society, and especially the United States, uh, there is such an emphasis on individualism, uh, on like achieving things, you know, material things, on who you are, what you have done in life, your work, right? When you forget that, I mean, uh, so basically this is part of the culture, of this culture of the American dream, right? And in, and in this book, there is a critique. Uh, of, of this society, of this type of society, who values you for who you are, right? Uh, I mean, for who you are, for what you have, right? Um, in, the other, in the other text, I think that interestingly, uh, in Alice Laplan uses the detective narrative, the crime uh, novel, to uh, again criticize um, this idea that you can lose, that you lose who you are and that other people take like advantage of that, uh, the children, the uh, state, uh, the whatever. I mean, like there are many factors in this novel that uh, sort of like interact so that uh, she is taken to prison, right? But the narrator, I mean, like she's struggling to say, I am still here, you know? I mean, like there is somebody, I am, even if I am, I have, I have lost my memory, but there is a person here, you know? And it's me, right? So in both novels, there is a huge critique of, of this notion that memory loss implies identity loss. Mm -hmm. thank so thank you, thank you. That was a very interesting question, and it was actually the question that made me write the book, uh, because I, for me, I had troubles uh, with that. I, it, it all started when I read, um, well, also for personal issues, I mean, in my family, I also had uh, persons with Alzheimer's and dementia and so on and so forth, so I, I, was, I had been working uh, on notions of identity for a long time in literature, you know, postmodernism and the construction of the identity and all these things, you know. And uh, when I read Jonathan Franzen's uh, essay about his father, uh, 
yes, my father's brain, right? That trigger, uh, uh, because he was really angry. Uh, Jonathan Franzen was really angry that his father had Alzheimer's and he was not his, like his father had been a very important man and he was uh, uh, such a man with a, so, uh, the brain and then at one point in the essay he said, now my father's brain, you know, is just a lump of meat or something like that, you know, uh, very strong and he had really like problems dealing with his father's Alzheimer's. Huh? So I, I, I started thinking about that, about, about how uh, if losing your memory, losing your spatial, uh, you know, uh, ability to navigate and so on, if it makes you just a lump of meat, in other words, right? Uh, it's so, so that was the question, you know, that I was asking myself and so uh, Thank you. There's two questions. First, yes. Melanie, and then. Um, I'm sorry, I think my question is not as interesting as the questions you had before. <laughs> but I was just wondering um, are you familiar with Japanese literature? Because there's a very like, big topic on memory on, in Japanese uh, literature, and it, your presentation made me think about the, um, this book I read last year, Nubi Bali Fleur. I checked, it's not been translated into Spanish or in English yet, but... I can, I can do my best. They made a movie out of it, it's called A Hundred Flowers, and um, it's about a mother who has a time mm -hmm. relations with her son, and there's this kind of natural disaster which, like, um, yeah, shows everything that's going on in her mind. And I was just wondering if you were thinking uh, no, I wish I was, uh, but uh, but let me tell you that one of the, the authors that I um, analyzed in the book is uh, of Japanese origin. She is uh, Asian American, she is uh, Ruth Oseki, I don't know if you know her, but uh, her mother had Alzheimer's and uh, in two of her books she presents her mother as a character in um, in, in her novel scene, uh, she's the author of My Year of Meats, uh, which is like about like this year of about eating meats and all the meat industry in the States. Uh, the second one was All Over Creation, and in All Over Creation, uh, there are lots of plants too, and so on, uh, and potatoes in Idaho. And uh, her mother loses, uh, appears, and she, she as a character. Uh, in And in the third one, um, a tale for the for the time being. Um, it's very interesting because it's like the, the, the last part of her mother's life and, uh, and she has lots of reflections on Alzheimer's and uh, uh, Ruth Oseki is a Buddhist priest and she sees Alzheimer's and her mother uh, sees, al sees Alzheimer's as a part of life, not as a way to go to, I mean like, uh, because from the Buddhist perception, you know, that, that there is only the present, that it that it's important, right? So when you forget the past, well, that's okay. I mean, like, we are living in the present, right? So there is, like, a more positive view of Alzheimer's, and she's, she analyzes Alzheimer's from this perspective, you know? And it's um, a heartwarming, I think, portrayal of, of Alzheimer's. So I would uh, I will read um, the thousand flowers. No, one hundred. I'm doing a movie out of it. Which uh -huh. is called a hundred flowers. A hundred flowers. But I haven't found the book in English translation, just in okay. French, and it's called Nubli Palé Fleur. Nubli Palé Fleur. de le lire. Thank you. So I would like to ask a question. According to your books and your research, um, how does dementia affect the patients, family, and friends? And more specifically, what what makes it extremely hard for them to accept it? Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, According to my books and to my experience, uh, personal experience, I think that it's very hard for uh, the family to accept. Um, dementia from an egocentric perspective uh, because we tend to think of the person that has Alzheimer's as our mother, our father, our and how it's very disturbing. I mean, to think that they don't recognize us, they may not recognize us, you know, that's it's um, and uh, it's very difficult to uh, well um, to deal with that, I think, in in general. Um, there are 
lots of different ways to deal with, uh, with that, uh, to try to understand that. Also, when dementia, in some cases, it's at, is advanced, I don't know how it is in France, but um, uh, th these mm, persons need professional care. So there are all lots of like economic issues here. I mean, like sometimes they can stay at home, but some of the times they have to be taken to a residential uh, facility. Sometimes you can pay for it, sometimes you can't. I mean, like it's all kind of issues um, that are there. But it's always difficult for the family to try to understand, um, you know. We do our best. And what can I say? I mean, like, I think that uh, the, the well, I think it's difficult, of course, for me. I mean, like, um, personally, right? There are things that are much worse. I mean, like to see somebody suffering in bed, I mean, like, you know, from a, some, a disease that it's very dramatic, that, that makes them suffer. This would be terrible for me to see somebody I love in this position. To see somebody who does not remember, I mean, like many things, even who I am. Well, I mean, it's difficult, but you get, you get by. But it's difficult, of course, yeah. So, I don't know, I mean, it's always good to read. Um, and see that you're not alone and that there are many, many uh, people nowadays. There are many movies uh, nowadays. I mean, you have the wonderful movie, The Father. I don't know if you have seen it. Uh, uh, Olivia Colman, I mean, she's brilliant. Um, and um, Anthony Hopkins, I believe, he's uh, the father. Wonderful movie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No more questions? Well, I have one. Could you tell us about your corpus, because you've mentioned um, you focused on two books, and uh, I'm very interested in, uh, in the type of books that you, you're focusing on. Okay. In, in the book, you mean in, the, in this or now? No, in, in the new project. In the new project, okay. Uh, yeah, because in the, in the um, well, mm, now... Uh, one uh, book that I'm working on uh, is uh, Cherry Moraga, a memoir. Uh, she wrote um, um, a, a, a memoir on her mother. Cherry Moraga is a Chicano writer. I don't know if you are familiar with her. Chicano means that she is a Mexican-American origin, uh, in case you're not familiar with that. Uh, she... Um, she she grew well. She was born in the states, but her mother was Mexican, her father was American, and so on. And uh, she, when her mother died, her mother had Alzheimer's, and when her mother died, she uh, wrote a memoir. And um, in this in this book, uh, she f mixes the memory loss in a cultural way, as your question, uh, like with the memory loss of the, the Chicanos and the Mexican, the indigenous people of, uh, of America. Uh, and she talks about all these colonizations, uh, you know, the Spanish colonization, the American colonization, and so on. And she mixes that, I mean, very interestingly, uh, with her mother. So I'm dealing, I'm working actually right now on that, uh, on uh, and housing. The, the, the house is built, o the, the house where her mother lived, is built over the tombs of Indians, uh, of Native American Indians um, and uh, Indians uh, of Mexican origin. Uh, so basically she's talking about that, about this memory loss and uh, this unhousing, uh, destroying the house and, and uh, all that in relation to, to Alzheimer's. So that's what I'm doing. How many books do you, are you planning to study to, for now? I mean, how many have you identified uh, for now? And well, you have houses everywhere. I mean, like, let me tell you that in in literature in general, big houses play like this huge. Um, Role. I mean, like it's it's uh, you you see it, uh, there is a house and uh, the house and in 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 the books in in books 
that deal with dementia, with Alzheimer's, uh, the house is very important because they are basically living in the house, right? I mean, so it's the central locus of, of the action, right? Uh, so I have lots of books that I have identified and that are interesting. And when you have dementia, you have unhousing. So I have lots of work to do, but, uh, but I have to narrow down my, my research. I will see. Right now I'm with Moraga. I think that... Um, that I, I, I'm trying to to do something with it. Mm -hmm. No further. I have another, but I have forgotten because I was listening to your own questions and uh, and um, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. A last question. I wanted to get back to the the, the, the names because you said I want to use the, the, the phrase residential unit mm -hmm. and not nursery home for instance yeah, yeah. and uh, I would like you to if you, if you don't mind uh, um, develop this particular mm -hmm. point on the, 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 the these, uh, these the names mm -hmm. of these yeah. particular facilities right uh, well for me nursery uh, implies uh, some sort of hospitalization uh, some sense of like um, a hospital right I mean like and also it has the double sense of treating uh, patients with Alzheimer's as if they were children this infantilization too uh, which I'm not sure it's I mean there are some theorists that are against uh, that um, so for me, residential unit is something that it's less, it has less connotations, and also because of the problematics of the word home, right? Because I mean, like, um, it's true that there is this idea that they want to make them feel at home in this uh, place, but the problem of the home, I'm not really like. I think that for me, it's more objective to use the residential unit. Um, but I don't know, what do you think? Are you okay? I mean, like with the nursing, nursing home, you like that? Yes? How many people like nursing home? Let's see. Hands up. Residential unit? Well, no, I am more, okay. <laughs> I've convinced you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You can use nursery, nursing home, both, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nursing home, mostly. Nursing home. Yeah. Yes. I think there's a very childish kind of uh, uh, connotation to the idea of nursing. So it leaves, like, it is obviously you lose some of your mental capacities and so you go back to being a child. Mm -hmm. I think it's very degrading in some way. Mm -hmm. But residential uh, facility also feels very impersonal. Mm -hmm. That's something about care to be maybe the more the middle ground. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Residential care unit or something. Mm -hmm. Could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's important. I mean, terms are important. Language is important. Um, and of course, it's, as, as I was saying, I mean, like the idea of, you know, when you work with, uh, with dementia, with Alzheimer's, I mean, the idea of saying to suffer from, right? Uh, it, this is something that uh, I, I try to avoid uh, because, I mean, like it implies, you know, this vision of the person suffering constantly. If you say a person has Alzheimer's, I mean, this is more, you know, objective, right? Mm. Takes. Especially because, I mean, like there, there have been studies, I mean, like of this representation of people with Alzheimer's as even a, as zombies, huh? as uh, this uh, speaking about the epidemics, the, uh, the, the this, uh, you know, this type of vocabulary, it's, it's definitely very loaded. It's dehumanizing. Yeah, it's dehumanizing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I have a question related to the second book that you talked about. So it was really interesting for me that like in this book it was the mother who wanted to achieve the American dream. Mm -hmm. Usually it's the husband who, who finally <coughs> to achieve this dream. And so it was kind of paradoxical for me. And I was thinking that like here clearly I think the mother sees um, the husband as, um, as the obstacle that makes them not. Achieve this dream. So, do you think that 
it was more the, the society and with the differences, living in a different society, they could have achieved this dream uh, with a person uh, in the family who has dementia or what do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, in this in this novel, it's true. I mean, it is the woman. Um, the novel, um, the author of the novel, Matthew Thomas, uh, his father had Alzheimer's. So there is a lot of uh, uh, you know autobiographical elements in this in this novel, and. Um, and uh, it is, uh, she is very ambitious from the beginning. The book, which is a, a huge, I don't think it's 700, 800 pages. I mean, it's uh, like they say, the epic book on Alzheimer's. Well, I don't know, but uh, it's a very long book. And the first part is dedicated to her because she is the daughter of Irish immigrants and she is the one who wants to have the American dream. Actually, when she starts uh, dating um, Ed, her husband. Um, she's very, she's like, I want to live in this, I want to do this, I'm very ambitious, I, mean, I want to make it big in, in America. And he's not um, worried about this at all. Uh, he actually refuses an important um, uh, contract in a pharmaceutical company or something like that, because he wants to work uh, with um, students who are Mm, well, not rich, let's say, uh, at a college, a uh, community college. Um, and she's the one who is all the time, you know, trying to improve. Obviously, here, uh, the focalization and the uh, narrator, who is um, basically from the perspective of the son, right, um, is siding with his father. I mean, like he, for him, it's obvious that his father has like the right view about life. I mean, like accepting things. And his mother is like totally wrong. I mean, like the, the portrayal of his mother is very negative in that sense. I mean, in the sense of not wanting to accept reality and wanted to always, you know, appearances, buying a fur coat, uh, you know, and things like that. So it's, it's in this case, it is this woman um, who has this American dream, but it's true that in general or in literature, I mean, I don't know, we have the great Gatsby, we have all these um, traditional representations of American dream. It's, it's, it's usually men, right, who, who have that. So, yeah, thank you. Shall we call it today? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.